I just want to encourage you in the presence of God here now. Just posture your heart and lean in to the love of God and what he has for you this afternoon. Come with expectation. Lean in and say, God, God, I want what you have. That love, that faithfulness, that filling. Say, God, I want it. I know, I know that it's there. I know that it's here. Just lean into that and expect. Say, God, okay, I'm ready. I want it. I want to receive from you. Let God's love, let hope in him just fill you. And say to the Lord today, just say, God, I want that love. Let his love just pour over you. It's not something that you have to work up to do or say the right words or do the right things. No, just come with a posture of openness to the Lord. Say, God, I'm here. I'm here. If you're living and if you're breathing, you are a candidate for God's love to be poured out into your life. There, there's nothing that you've done that disqualifies you from God's love. There's no place that you've gone, no words that you've said, no things that you've done that disqualifies you from the love of God. You are a person who can receive the love of God. Just settle it in your heart right now. God's love is here. God's love is real. God's love is for me. So just open up your heart. Open up your mind to receive the truth. Some, some things you may have heard in the past from other people or thoughts that you've thought because of this or because of that. No, just say no to all that and receive from the truth of the word of God that his love is real and that his love is for you. Just come with a posture of faith. Come with a posture of expectation. Come with a posture of receiving from the Lord this afternoon. We're just going to continue in God's presence. But we're going to open up the Word of God and look at a few things here today. If you want to open your Bible to 1 Corinthians 13. We're going to start this week. We're going to start looking at love. We've already sang about it. We've already prayed about it a little bit here. We're going to talk about the love of God. And today we're starting a series where we're going to go through a number of verses in the Bible and just to find out, okay, what is God's love? What is true love really like? What is the love that God has for us? What is the love that we can have towards other people? What does God expect of us in love? And these are all the things that we're going to talk about and look at in these next few weeks. But I, I really want to emphasize that coming to God's love, you know, it, it's hard for us. I mean, even in, even in this series that we, we're going to have for a number of weeks that we're going to start today, we can't describe God's love adequately. We, we can never be exhausted uh, you know we can never exhaustively speak about all of the things that God's love is like it's like a it's like an ant trying to describe a skyscraper it's just it's just too wonderful too great but we're gonna look and see what the Bible teaches some of the verses in the Bible that talk about his love but even though we may not be able to understand it completely. We're going to understand some things about it, but 
that doesn't mean you can't experience it. And so as we talk about God's love and we open the word and we see the things that God says about his love, always have an open heart. Just say, God, okay, look, okay, here's my heart. Here's my heart. And I want you to do something in me. I want you to change me. I want you to remake me into what you want me to be, a child of your love. As we look at the love of God, it's important for us to understand what we're talking about when we're talking about love. You know, the Bible has a number of, uh, a few different words that were in the original language, in the original Greek, that are translated into our English Bible, love. And it's interesting because there are some different meanings in those original Greek and Hebrew words that are translated into love. But we only have, in English, we only have one word, and that's the word love. But we, it's very, very important that we spend time thinking about, okay, what is God's love? What is, what is his love really, really like? And so there's a, a number of different words, but there's basically four main concepts of love in the Bible. The first one would be like a brotherly love. And it talks about that in some of Paul's writings. He you know, have brotherly love for each other. And so it's a fondness. It's a, a friendship, a, a, a kind of love where you say, okay, yeah, I'm really fond because I, I, I really, really fond of that person because I love spending time with them and they're good friends of mine and we have good memories together. We have good, spent good times together. And so there's a, a bond there, a connection, a feeling of warmth and openness to that person because of the times that you have spent together. Another kind of love would be a family love. And a family love is very similar to a brotherly love, but it's kind of on a deeper level because you've known that person in your family your whole life. You, you, you've grown up with them. And maybe even they're not very lovely. Maybe they're not very you know, to, to the normal person, they might be someone who, who, you know, most people wouldn't get really, really get along with, or it would be difficult to love them, but because they're our family, we're like, yeah, I love them. I love that person. They're even, even the, the difficult things about them. Yep, I love them. Yep, they're my family. Another type of love would be kind of the romantic love between a man and a woman or a husband and wife. And uh, the Bible talks a lot about that as well. The one love that is the main love that's talked about in the New Testament would be called agape love. And some of you guys may have heard that Greek word before, but it's probably the most famous type of love in the Bible. It's agape love. And a lot of people would say that that, is, that, that would describe God's love towards us. It would be a love that is committed no matter what comes. It's unconditional. It's not a love that you can earn. It's God's love that he gives freely because he is love. And it's a committed love. It's a love that says, I am committed to you. I have made a decision that I am going to love you no matter what comes. I'm going to provide. I'm going to protect. I'm going to give. I'm going to, to sacrifice for you. That love, that agape love, and that's God's love towards us. If we look in the Bible, you know, some of the famous verses, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. That word love in there is the agape love. It's God's love towards us. And, you know, even when it talks about how God loves people who, who are still sinners, God loves us. Agape. He's committed. He loves us so much. His great, awesome, amazing love is a love that is here and now and committed to you. It's for you. 
It's for us. It's that unconditional, committed, stick it out through and through, thick and thin. It's love. It's God's love towards us. Let me read a verse from 1 John 4, verse 10, talking about his love. It says, And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. He loved us. Love comes from God. Love comes from God. It originates with God. This verse says, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and gave himself, gave his son to be, to be the price that he paid, to be our redemption, to be our salvation, to be our freedom, to be our deliverance. This is love. We think, yeah, I got to love God. I got to love. No, it originates. It begins with the Lord. It begins with him. His love for us. That's what this verse says in 1 John 4.10. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the redemption for our sins. But it doesn't just stop there. God has a, a massive, amazing, wonderful love for us. But he also expects us to love him and to show that same agape love to others. He didn't just say, okay, here's love, but he wants us to represent him in showing that love to others as well. Listen to some of these verses. In Ephesians 5, verse 25, Husbands, love your wives. That word, agape. Agape, love your wife. That means you're committed. It's unconditional. No matter what they do, love them. Love them. Husbands, love your wives. Just, look at, look at, look at the example it says here. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. If you are a husband and you have a wife, God's calling for you is to love your wife just like God loves the church, just like Jesus loves the church. It describes the church as the bride of Christ. Okay? So husbands, we have got to love our wives. Agape, love our wives. Committed, unconditional love. Matthew 5:44. The words of Jesus, he says, I say to you, love your enemies. Not love your enemies if you feel warm and nice and comfortable with them. No, this is the agape love. Love your enemies. Be committed to them. Think the best for them. Help them. Look out for them. This is Jesus' words about our enemies. Our enemies, the people who would persecute us and say negative things about us. Jesus says, love them. Love them. Show them the same love that God in heaven showed you even when you were still a sinner, still in your sins. He says, I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. Matthew 22 verses 37 to 39 also says, Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. And you can probably guess each time that word love is used there, it's the word agape. So we see, <clears throat> we see that God pours out his love for us. He's got great love, unconditional, committed love for us. But he also says, okay, now you've received, now you give. You've received from God, now you give. And so 
give that agape love to each other. And that's what God is encouraging us to do. It's interesting. <clears throat> God doesn't ask us to be fond of our neighbor. The Greek word for being fond for somebody is phileo. It's that brotherly, that heart commitment, that, 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 uh, that fondness that we have. He doesn't say, do that. Have, a, have warm feelings for your neighbor or have warm feelings for your enemy. If that was the case, we'd, it'd be so difficult to love our enemy because a lot of times God asks us to love people we don't really have a lot of warmth for. But God says it's not that kind of love. It's this commitment type of love. Here's another verse in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 to 11. John says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. Whoever loves has been born of God. So one of the ways you know that you're born of God is if you love. Whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, and this is the key here, beloved, if God so loved us, it means if God loved us in this way, if God sacrifice for us, loved us unconditionally, loved us committed. If he loved us in this way, it says, we also ought to love one another. Sometimes you might have a hard time loving your neighbor. Sometimes you might have a hard time loving your enemy. Sometimes you might have a hard time loving your sister or your brother or even your spouse. This says, if God loved us, we also ought to love one another. So get into the love of God. Once we understand the love of God and the commitment and the sacrifice and the vastness of his love for us, then it'll transform us from the inside out and we'll be able to love one another. We see the different types of love in another story in John chapter 21. In John chapter 21, it's the last verse of the book of, the last chapter of the book of John. It's when Jesus came to his disciples and he was on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Peter and some of the other disciples were in the boat fishing. They saw Jesus from a long way off and, and Peter jumps in the water, starts swimming towards the shore and wants to be with Jesus. The rest of the disciples are left to bring all the fish on the onto the beach and they have breakfast together and spending time with Jesus. It's a beautiful, beautiful scene. You know, Jesus comes to them and they share a meal together, spend some time together. <clears throat> but this is after, after the time when John, or sorry, when Peter denied Jesus three times. And you know, that was before Jesus died on the cross and all that stuff. So all this time went by. And so now Peter's spending time with, John, uh, with Jesus. The disciples are with Jesus. And we catch this moment here in John chapter 21, verses 15 to 17. <clears throat> it says, When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to, Pe to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you, do you love me more than these? And the word that Jesus used there was the word agape. Do you agape me? Do you, are you committed to me? And Simon, Simon Peter answered, he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. But the word love there is the, the fond, fondness type of love, the, the phileo love. So Jesus asked him, Do you agape me? Simon answers, No, I... I, 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 I phileo you. I have fondness for you. I, I love you in, in a brotherly way. Then Jesus asked him a second time, 
or sorry, then Jesus answers him, feed my lambs. Then Jesus asked him a second time. He said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Do you agape me? And Simon answers, he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. But he keeps using the word phileo all the time. And then Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. And then the third time, Jesus asks Simon, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And the, love, the word love there that Jesus uses is the word phileo. Do you have fondness for me? Do you have that brotherly love for me? So it's hard to know exactly what was going through Peter's mind at this time. You know, Jesus is asking for this commitment. Do you have this committed love, this unconditional love? But maybe, just maybe, Peter was thinking back to this time when he denied Jesus. And he said, Jesus, I want to have that agape love for you, but we look back and you see, I wasn't committed to you then. I don't know if I can be committed to you. I don't know if I can keep going. I don't know if I can, you know, love you that same way that you love me. And so he answers him, no, I, feel, I, feel, I, I love you, but it's a, the brotherly love. I have fondness for you. But Jesus is so gracious and he says, he says, feed my lambs. Do you feed my sheep? Simon answers, Lord, you know everything. You know that I have fondness for you. And Jesus says to him, feed my sheep. But here we kind of see the differences, but God wants us to grow in our love. And from this time on, we don't see any time when Peter is not committed to Jesus again. He, maybe he was remembering the time when he wasn't committed, but he's saying, Jesus, I, I, he, he probably was thinking, I, you know, I want to, but this is the love that I have for you. But after this, we see the book of Acts and him preaching and proclaiming the word of God, the good news of Jesus, uh, life, death, burial, and resurrection, his salvation for the Gentiles. And he, uh, he was committed all of this time, all the way until tradition has it that Peter was crucified on a cross upside down because he was committed to Jesus. And this is the commitment that God wants us to have to him as well. Maybe you don't, maybe you're kind of like Peter and you don't know, you don't feel that you're worthy of saying, yeah, I have that agape love for God. But that's okay. Jesus has that God, agape love for you. And as long as you're committed and as long as you're willing to walk with the Lord like Peter did, God will help you to grow in that and grow in these areas. So the verses that we're going to look at in this series is 1 Corinthians 13. And let me just read that. We're going to look at the verses 4 to 7. And we're going to look at this. And it says, Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And if you haven't guessed by now, that word love that's used in 1 Corinthians is agape. It's that agape, committed, unconditional love that God encourages us to have for, for, uh, for him and for each other. And why is love so important? If we look at 1 Corinthians as a whole, if we look at the whole book, if we look at not just chapter 13, chapter 13 is the love chapter, but if we look at chapter 12 and 13 and 14, we can see how significant, how important love is in the life of a believer. And if you look at chapter 12, you can, and you read chapter 12, chapter 12 is all about spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts and, and helping people, encouraging people, showing the power of God, showing the love of God, showing, showing the miracles and signs and wonders and words of wisdom and all of that sort of stuff. Then if you look at chapter 14, it's the same. It talks about, 
you know, speaking in tongues and the gifts of prophecy and, and this and that. And so we have 12 here. We have 14 over here. But right in the middle is this chapter about love. And Paul is saying here, he says, okay, so this is important. Spiritual gifts are important. Prophecy, words of wisdom, miracles, all that's important. And then in 14, yeah, yeah, don't, don't neglect these things. Pursue them. But in chapter 13, he says, don't forget about love. Don't forget about love. And listen to this verse at the beginning of chapter 13. This is 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 and 2. And Paul says this. He says, Even though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but if I do not have love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And if you think about symbols, okay, we have a drum set here. We have lots of symbols there. Symbols are great. When you play it, when the drummer plays the drums, he's drumming along and it crashes the cymbal. Yeah. And symbols are good every once in a while. Okay? But if the drummer just got up here on a Sunday service and just went just crashing on the cymbal for the whole entire service, that would be quite annoying. All right? And you wouldn't be able to sing any songs. You probably would get off of the stage real quick. That was the last time you're ever going to drum because, you know, it's just too wild, right? So, so, so think about this. The crashing cymbals are good at the right time, at the right place. You know, you're not gonna... There, there, there's a... Uh, there's a famous symphony. Um, it's called the... It, it's actually called... It's called the 1812 Overture. One of my favorite... Uh, I don't know what the word is. The, I guess it's an overture. Uh, it's one of my favorite songs that I've listened to. I've listened to it uh, for lots of, lots of times over the years. But it's a really interesting song because it builds up and it builds up and, it, and it's a real long song. It's, it's probably about 15 minutes from beginning to end the whole song. And the song starts, you know, kind of quietly and stuff and then it builds and builds and builds and then it goes quiet again and then it builds and builds. After about 13 minutes, okay, if you're going to go listen to this, don't cheat and skip to the 13 minute mark because you have to listen to the whole thing right from the beginning. I, after 13 minutes, there's actually cannons that, that, that blast in the song. And uh, it's really cool to listen right from the very beginning and then hear the build up and then it goes back down and, and hear the build up again and then... And it's just the timing of it all. And it's great, but it's got to be at the right time. And I think that's what Paul's getting at here with spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts are awesome. They're amazing. They grab your attention. But it's got to be in the context of the whole song. It's got to be in the context of love. The context of the whole love story of Jesus and the good news of Jesus that he wants to bring. If you're just wanting spiritual gifts for the sake of, wow, amazing, awesome, great, awesome, amazing. Okay, that's the wrong motivation. He says here, if that's all I want, but I don't have love, I'm just a symbol that keeps clanging and clanging and clanging and clanging. No, it's got to be in the whole context of love. And think about someone who has a spiritual gift and they're filled with love. They use that spiritual gift in such a sensitive way. They're praying, they're thinking, they're looking at the person and they want to use it in the right way to give glory to God. But so that person's heart and life can be changed through love. 
And God's love is the same way. He wants to do awesome things in us, but he wants us to be transformed by his love. Paul continues, And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. I am nothing. God wants us to receive of his love, but also be a source of love to those people who are around us. And that's what we're going to be looking at in this series. We're going to be looking at what is love? What does God's love consist of? Each week we're going to go through some of these points in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 7. And I would encourage you this week to spend time reading 1 Corinthians 13 over and over again and ask God, God, I'm going to open up my heart to your love. And so we're going to look at what do these things mean about God's love for us? And how can I have this type of love for other people as well? How can I have that? Another thing that you might do while you're reading 1 Corinthians 13 is compare it with the fruit of the Spirit. God doesn't just say, okay, yep, go ahead, go love people all by yourself. Yep, this is what you're supposed to do. No, he fills us with the Spirit of God so that we can love in that committed way to other people as well. And some of these things in this, in this chapter in 1 Corinthians 13 are the same as the fruit of the Spirit. Patience, kindness, they're the fruit of the Spirit. And so God wants to fill you with his love, fill you with his Spirit, and through the Spirit that's in you, that love overflows into other people. This is God's desire for each one of us. This is God's desire for love in us, from him, and through us as well. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your great love. It is an amazing, boundless, limitless, unconditional, committed love that you have for us. And God, we can never know the highest heights of your love, the deepest depths of your love. It is too wonderful, too amazing for us to understand and believe. But yet, it is true. It is true. Your love for us is true. And so today, we position ourselves in faith. We open our hearts and say, yes, God, I receive. Your love is true, and it's true for me. So I open my heart and I receive it by faith. And God, I pray today on behalf of all of us as well, I pray today that you would do your work in us so that that love can spring out from us like a, like a river of living water. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we can love, we can give. We can show that agape love to a world that lacks love, that doesn't know true love yet. God, I thank you for what you have done in us, but let it not stop with us. We give our hearts and our lives to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing about God's love. One more song before we finish here today. I encourage you just to enter into God's love. Enter into the song, sing it in faith, and just let God work and touch and fill your heart this afternoon. God bless you.